Hello, Warriors. Let's have a great week. We have a full week of trading. Let's pick our spots. Probe and protect. How's everyone doing today? So I'd like to start off with the WTI, Anatomy of an Ambush. Good, Sean. So I just want to take you through my psychology and crude and how I make mistakes as well. So I was very patient all the way through this, thinking that we could get a test of 61.8, thought I missed it here, and then here we were. So I had been waiting for this number for at least a few weeks. And then once it got up there, I'm going, well, you know, maybe there's a one more jiggle up to this channel line. And, you know, do I want to be short from 58 and a half if it has potential to go to 60? And then we closed here before Thanksgiving. And on Friday, when no one was looking, $3 break in crude. Okay, so here's the lesson. And, you know, sometimes you have to learn the same lessons over and over, even years later. And this is it. If you've done your work and you have diagnosed an area, a technical area, where you want to put a trade on and it gets there, put a piece on. So I could have put a piece on risking the trend line here, but you know what? I want it to be perfect. I wanted it to be the correct one hour candle or four hour candle. And I did wasn't willing to sell it at a number I've been waiting for for a month because it's all in our heads. I started to doubt my number because it didn't get rejected forcefully right away. But the number was a great number. And I actually know people that took this trade up here. Okay, so what the lesson is, if you've done your work and you've been waiting for a spot, when it gets to that spot, you don't have to go all in, but you should do something or, or why do the work? But you see, doubt, fear, of an extension of this rally prevented me from taking a trade at an area I'd been talking about and forecasting for weeks, and now here we are. Okay, it's not the end of the world, but it's a it's a lesson that I had to learn again. So what, how now, brown cow? I think the highs are in, and now you sell a reflex rally sometimes. This may have been it, but to me, this whole thing measures eventually down to 52 at least down in here 53 52 and in fact that's what Roggy horner was talking about and then also remember that shy girl talked about well you know she too thought we could go up to this trend line this was the line she had me draw during her interview but she also said that uh crude would be under pressure in december Okay, so it happened one day before December because uh, all the producers don't want to be taxed on their inventory and they push it out. So uh, was that instructional for you guys? Have you ever done that before? Uh, you have a plan and then the market's at where you were planning to do something and then you second guess yourself about that? Well, don't do that anymore. So the worst case scenario is I was wrong, right? Or I was early. And this is opportunity lost to me. It doesn't show up in your account, but it's something that you have to take into account. Otherwise you're wasting your time doing this. Okay, so I feel like I wasted my time monitoring this all the way here, got to my level and I did nothing. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about it. Uh, hi, Monica. So I know if I do it, and I have done it, that a lot of people do this. So why not write it down? When it gets to my area, sell at least or buy at least a partial position at a spot that you had analyzed for 
quite some time before it manifested. And then at least you would have had something on or I would have had something on. Okay, so uh, uh, something else that happened Friday when no one's looking was uh, this little reversal in Euro. And they flushed out all the stops. Uh, looks like a three driver to me, you know, one, two, three. And looks like we're gonna come out of here in the Euro. Probably have stops right here under 97, still tight and 1080 and maybe higher. Okay, so Euro looks okay. In fact, uh, I like uh, EG. I thought we could get one more break in EG. Still could happen. I think Steve was talking about, I don't know, 8480 or so, which is kind of where this wedge is coming in. And, you know, I keep coming back to this weekly on Euro Pound. And I keep seeing how it peaked, which I caught, but it's very unusual. If the, why, why do I think there's potential for e even down the road, a higher high in uh, EG? Anyone know? Out of uh, hundreds of you here today, because of this reading, almost 80 up here. So this was uh, unusual for a market to peak and be this deep after a confirmed high. All right, so looking at that, uh, looking at the yen, uh, right against the 200 day up here, uh, we're starting to get some nice divergence on the four hour up here. Uh, this uh, moving average comes in around 980. A lot of people, in fact, I saw some tweets about this being a major breakout here at this eight and a half level. Uh, it's my contention we peak between here and 110. And uh, what's behind that is, in fact, the relationship between the yen and uh, yields divorced itself last week because the bonds had a good week and so did the yen. So it's normally the other uh, US dollar yen went up while these were going up. It's usually the other way around. And uh, still continue to keep an eye on this. This is your trade war currency. And uh, I think there's gonna be a problem with risk on should we get here. And I think that eventually we will the only thing that would change is 695. So, you know, we, we've we been holding this breakout for one, two, three weeks. Uh, we start heading up here, it could be seven new highs. New highs in uh, US dollar one, maybe 723, 727. Those were some FIB extensions that Steve mentioned. And let's see, was there, and oh yeah, how about these guys? So you're, you have your first uh, divergence on a four hour in S&Ps, 3160 was the high. We're coming off now. I didn't do anything yet, but stalking this once again. And um, pesos. You know, since 1924, it's been, it's been acting okay. And, you know, I remember talking about it here and here. So done nothing wrong yet. Uh, it's kind of, it could be a sign of risk off. I mean, uh, according to uh, what I learned from Blake is normally this is going down during risk on. So we've had quite a few weeks with it not making new lows. And, you know, you look at the weekly chart and it held where it had to hold on the peso above all the moving averages right now looks destined to higher prices to me guys so any questions on any of the markets that i've looked at before i pass it over to blake okay great yeah, everyone understands everything i'm a great communicator aren't i 
Hi, Blake. How are you, buddy? Good morning, Dale. You have a good weekend, man? I had a great long weekend. It was a nice Thanksgiving. How was your Thanksgiving? Oh, good. Fine. Uh, I, you know, watch a lot of football and uh, <laughs> a neighbor brought me over a whole Thanksgiving meal. Nice. Uh, so, you know, love thy neighbor in action. It was pretty nice. And uh, yeah, I'm footballed out. Uh, I don't even know if I could watch Monday night today. <laughs> <That's too much. laughs> Fried, man. But I'll tell you, the best game of the year was that Auburn, Alabama playing with two backup freshman quarterbacks. And I've never seen a game go back and forth like that in a long time. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. I had a, my son had a, believe it or not, a soccer tournament this weekend, which uh, consumed my entire Saturday and some of my Sunday mornings. So I didn't get to watch any football on Saturday, but did uh, you tell him not to live in woulda, coulda, should have land? Yeah, I was telling Is that him. the same son. Yep. And okay. uh, un unfortunately, now, I was thinking about that, Blake, you know, that's really going to serve him later. Well, really is, you know, he's, he's fortunate to, you know, have a father to guide him on things like that. You know, some kids don't. Yeah. So that's going to help him out later in life when he's looking, oh, if I only would have, could have, should he'll, he'll be telling his kids, hey, don't live in would could have, should have land. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah, let's, hope, yeah. let's, yeah, hope that, let's hope that sticks, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it, uh, it actually lost on um, the championship game uh, yesterday morning. So it was kind of a bummer, uh, yeah. you know, and he was the, he was the goalkeeper the second half and, you know, only, only one got past him, but you know, still he's just like, oh, you know, yeah. if this know. player would have done that and that player, down, I'm like, you know, it was a team effort. And yeah. uh, next is yeah, the next, next yeah, important yeah. word for yeah. exactly next game. Yeah, exactly. You know, they, they play, they played our higher ranked team anyway. So, so you think your all has a chance here, Blake? I mean, it, it did a, uh, you know, a little bit of a reversal, on the shortened session Friday, seems like it wants to pop a little bit. You know, I'm hoping so. Um, we are, uh, we are, hold on one second. Sure. Option volatility. Yeah, look at that. Okay, so I know what you're going to be talking about now is um how how low euro volatility is well euro volatility chart. well euro volatility is not just you know not just the euro specifically it's more of a volatility chart just in general but it's a it's a good representation of how tame volatility in the fx market is yeah and what i wanted to point out here is um you know i i, I was i was you know it takes a nice long weekend to uh to uh, uh, you know, um, do reflection. reflection. Yeah, 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 reflection and and um, and and for me, you know, I was looking at like my P and L over the last several years, trading for you know for the firm and looking at you know volatility. And I would say there's 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 a direct correlation for me um, regarding my trading. Um, uh, P and L versus, versus volatility. If you notice like, uh, j like 2015, give you an example here, 2015, a lot of volatility in the Euro, right? Yeah. You know, it gives us as traders, a lot of opportunities to buy and sell, buy and sell. You, you know, you're, you, 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 um, are, you can be on the wrong side and still finesse the market to a point where you can, you know, work yourself out of, you know, bad positions and you have opportunities to make money too. Uh, same with like 2016, you know, similar type of situation, right? Yep. 2017, still a lot of volatility, even though the, the volatility st started to drop, but still a lot of up and down action. Now you'll notice the last two years, you know, Nothing. very low volatility, very low volatility. And if you have, as a trader, you've, you've sat there and you're like, man, I found it very difficult the last couple of years to trade the markets. I don't think that's uncommon. I think it's very common. And this is where, you know, you have to, um, you know, this is where you have to say, 
you know, this is where the strong survive. This is how the strong survive the markets is the ones that can stick around through these periods of low volatility, because when volatility picks up, you want to be in front of your computer. You want to be able to take advantage of the market. You want to be able to take advantage of the, the you know, the, the back and forth the market will give you. And right now, especially the last two years, it has been extremely difficult. And I would say there's a direct correlation with most traders regarding the volatility or lack thereof the last couple of years. Again, focus on the last couple of years. This is 2018 and this is basically, uh, oh, this is 2019, right? Very, very low volatility um, and it continues to drop to, to record lows. And while we're, you know, dealing with low volatility, it's, it's uh, how do I erase everything? Clear all drawings. Okay, there we go. Um, you know, how we deal with with low volatility is is actually doing what what um, Dale was just talking about a little bit earlier about really focusing on your entries and where you know you want to get in the market and that's it's an important point and I and I was going to chime in when you were talking Dale but I didn't want to uh, interrupt you is that we we do all this work and we're like, man, I, I really want to buy, you know, the Euro here. I want to sell the Euro here. I want to buy the, you know, the whatever currency we're trading uh, or thinking about trading, you know, wherever those pinpoint areas that you, you've, 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 you know, done your homework and you said, this is exactly where I want to buy or sell a currency pair. You wait, hold on. True. Oh, I was just reading this. Uh, this a little headline just came out. Um, on Bloomberg here, nothing, nothing big. What that he's um, running for president? Is he no, running it no, there? No, no. <laughs> um, but but knowing where you want to get in and getting in at those places is so vitally important. And that's why, you know, like I I put I have open orders in the market most of the time. Watch out, the futures are hitting lows right now. Just FYI, um, you know I I keep open orders in the market. Um, like for example. I have a euro bid still at 109.70. Did it get hit? No. Is it still there? Yep. <laughs> you know, will it will it ever get to me? I don't know. You know, I, I you know it seems doubtful at this point. But um, but I you know I had it and I'll probably end up canceling it. Um, but when I see you know these these areas, like I, I was looking for this double top and double top to complete and get down to 109.70, and I was hoping to get long there. Um, if a currency pair gets to the price that you had been forecasting. This is exact words of what Dale was saying earlier. You know, you, it's important that you take action at those areas. Um, and, and whether it's, you know, you, you buy a piece, you sell a piece, you have an, an open order to, to, to get you in or get you out. Cause you, you, you wanted to get in there or you wanted to sell it, or you wanted to buy it for a specific reason at that point. And every night, what you should do is you should go back and take a look at those prices and make sure that those are still valid levels for you to get in. You know, like over the weekend, I was looking at the Euro at, you know, 109.70 uh, and I was thinking, man, if it still gets down there, I want to own, <laughs> excuse me, I wanted to own it. And, um, and we never got there, but that's, you know, it, it still was valid to me. And, and I, I do that work every single day. And, um, uh, try to, try to, uh, try to get the, God, I'm getting a couple of, hold on really quick. I'm sorry. Again, I'm getting messages all over the place. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I've had, ironically, people have been chiming in that talk to me this morning on Bloomberg. So it's uh, kind of weird. Um, so anyway, I uh, just, you know, a few things that a few things to think about. Now, uh, the cables at its highs, um, there is, I read this story, and I'm not really too sure what to make of it. But, um, you know, I, I read the story that one of the you gov polls are going to get recounted. Is that Stelios, did you read something about that? And what does that mean? What's that necessary? Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I did 
didn't actually read that. What I did read was that there were a few more polls showing that the Conservatives' lead is uh, narrowing. narrowing a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that too. But there was something this morning regarding the YouGov polls um, that, uh, huh. uh, okay. um, you know, I'm sure somebody's going to chime in uh, regarding regarding that. But anyway, the cable is firmed up and, and it's at its highs of the day. Now, you know, it doesn't mean that, um, that uh, Max devices at the same time... Huh? Uh, I don't know what happened there. Um, okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, we, uh, we're nearing our highs of the session and, um, and I think what we, uh, this is something that I wanted to bring up, um, or, you know, I brought up over the weekend. We just want to make sure that, you know, if, if we start breaking this 129.70, more importantly, 130, 130, 30, uh, we need to start paying really close attention to the, uh, to the cable. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's amazing. We've seen this tight consolidation in the pair, but we have not seen it break down. You know, the Euro has been drifting lower, but um, we have not, um, uh, uh, it is, it's not, you know, really impacted the pound dollar where the Euro pound has been moving lower, of course. But the, the reason why I bring that up is because if, if you're out there, you know, buying dollars just, you know, a, a, across the board, but you're not getting any payout being short the cable, you're going to start to get a little worried about, you know, any cable positions that you have on the short side. I'm still in the camp that as long as we're above 128, 127.50, there's, the, you know, the, the, the risk is still for an upside move in the cable. But, um, I, you know, specifically, I'll be watching like the euro and if the euro gets above, you know, this level, which is like 110.50, this, this is stuff I mentioned on the weekend video, if you guys weren't paying attention. Uh, if we make it above 110.50, then, you know, then you start to see some more broad-based dollar weakness. And if that happens, you know, what's going to happen with, uh, with, uh, with the, the cable. And a, a couple other things that I, that I, you know, noticed and, and uh, is first of all, the Aussie and the Kiwi, you know, are pretty strong today. You see the Aussie breaking higher, which is interesting because we have all this, uh, you know, China news that is, uh, that, that is, um, you know, we have uh, what seems to be that the U S and China are not going to come to an agreement, um, you know, before, you know, before the end of the year. And it looks like more, more like January. And I think that's starting to weigh on the market. Um, you know, what Trump is going to do with the tariffs on the 15th, um, is to be seen, but the Aussie has been, you know, very strong. So is the Kiwi and the Kiwi's broken out of this, uh, this range that we've been in. And a matter of fact, if you haven't looked at the New Zealand dollar recently, we're at levels we haven't seen since, uh, since, you know, the summer. So the, the Kiwi's trying to break higher out of a base. It's hard to trust these moves, um, because of the risk aversion that you're seeing in the market at the moment, you know, the, the little sell-off that we're seeing in, in stocks, and it's like, well, why is the Kiwi so strong right now? But it is. We are ha hitting a minor resistance level, you know, minor trend line resistance, even though we're broken, we, we're, we're breaking out of this uh, 6450. I think it's going to be really interesting if we can close above 6450 today. Because if you, you know, look back in October, we were making a run for this resistance and then, you know, we closed below. You can see how, you know, you have to look at this candle and this is uh, October 31st. You can see that candle, that candle was all, you know, green or, you know, in this case, white or blue, you know, it was a bullish candle at one point. And then by the end of the day, we slumped, you know, and, 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 and closed back below 6450. Is that going to be the case today? I don't know. I mean, we have to drop 25 pips from where we're currently at that, would, that you're, it seems like you're asking for a lot in this particular pair with the lack of volatility that we've seen in the market, but you know, you never know. I mean, it, if, if equities continue to grind lower, you know, you might get traders that look at the Kiwi and go, what's, what's the Kiwi doing up here and start selling it. So um, it, it's tough to say, but I think it's something that, uh, that, that we should be watching. Uh, another thing that's, you know, kind of signaling that the market's a little, you know, a little nervous here is the dollar Canadian, you know, the dollar Canadian is, pretty well bid today, you know, and this is complete opposite of what you're seeing in the Kiwi and the Aussie. 
is you're seeing the dollar Canadian actually stronger, but the dollar Canadian stronger like it is, is, you know, a, in my opinion, an early signal of some risk aversion. So when you see the dollar Canadian bid up the way it is, you got to, you got to be a little careful. Uh, dollar Mexican peso also, you know, Dale mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it is stronger uh, this morning. You know, the, the re, re, um, restoring tariffs on, on steel, um, you know, uh, ship from Brazil and Argentina. You can see that, that headline that came out earlier this morning. It's weighing on some of the, you know, emerging market currencies and you're seeing the, uh, the dollar Mexican peso actually firm up. And that's when the stock market actually started to show some weakness is when that, that headline came out in Bloomberg earlier this morning. I'm talking about, you know, two, two and a half hours ago. So uh, watch the dollar Mexican peso. It's been grinding its way up and, you know, as Dale mentioned, and this is something that, you know, I talk about often is that in a period of risk, you know, risk on, you tend to see a weaker US dollar Mexican peso. Why the dollar Mexican peso has been as strong as it's been the last couple of weeks has been more of a head scratcher, but also leads me to believe that if there is a period of risk aversion, if we do see stocks come under pressure, the dollar Mexican peso is at risk of, you know, challenging 20 and possibly even moving higher than that. So I think, uh, you know, keeping an eye on the dollar Mexican peso as as it diverges away from, um, you know, from, from risk appetite right now, you know, general risk appetite that we've seen in, in recent, uh, in recent um, weeks is something to, uh, to keep an eye on because if this thing starts rallying aggressively, then you know that that's a signal that stocks are probably going to be under some pressure. So something that, you know, I'm obviously paying pretty close attention to right now. And then uh, last but not least, I'm going to pass it over to Stelios and Steve is uh, um, the U S dollar Japanese yen. Uh, the U S dollar Japanese yen is uh, nearing its, nearing its highs of the session uh, or it was near its highs of the session near 127% extension. We had a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a minor trend line up here. I thought we could make it up to 109.80. Um, but, you know, it's it's trading near its lows of the session right now because the market is signaling some risk off. So keep an eye on the dollar yen. I think if the dollar yen drops back below like 109.30, 109.35, um, that's going to, it's going to be a little rocky for, for equities. Uh, so it's just, Again, it's something that I think we should be a little, little cognizant of. I, I was trying to trade the, the dollar yen on the short side last week unsuccessfully, and I'm not um, touching it right now, but it doesn't mean that I don't watch it closely. And I think it's something that we need to continue to monitor. Um, Steve Stelios, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Blake. Good morning. Good morning. Um, how are you guys doing? Good. How have you been? Mm, good. Um, I am just, uh, just, you know, monitoring the markets. Markets look a little heavy today. Uh, what do you, what do you make of that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, you know, go on and I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Sir. I was going to say that, um, you know, we saw the reaction by the Chinese on the, um, the U S bill for the, um, uh, which supported the, uh, pro Democrats in Hong Kong. So there was a reaction to that, but they had nothing to do with trade. So they talked about, um, if I recall, they put some sanctions on some human rights organizations and something about Navy ships. So basically nothing on trade. So that I would have thought would have been positive. Um, but uh, in, the, in the last, say, half hour, stocks are turning a little bit lower. I, I don't see any particular um, movement uh, and particular reason for that move. I don't know what you think, Steve, but... Um, Initially, I thought that uh, the uh, the response by the Chinese was not a bad thing, or for stocks anyway. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, but you know, if if logic was uh, driving the market, you know, we would have a totally different market to talk about. Yeah. 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 All right. Well. Well. Um, well. You know, I think one of the things that we should be, you know, this is the S and P. And, uh, and, and Dale said it a little earlier, which uh, is, is, uh, is pretty accurate, that intraday we're seeing, you know, a divergent relative strength as we made new highs in futures. You can see the, you know, high in, high in futures here, and then, you know, the relative strength did not hit highs. That's something to pay a little 
attention to. I think this daily candle is going to be kind of important because if we made a false breakout to the upside overnight and then we close on its lows, which, you know, there's so much time left in today. So if we close on its lows, then, uh, then, you know, that's going to be a risk for, for equities. So something to, uh, to pay attention to going into this week, but it's a big week with data. We have um, non-farm payroll, uh, Canadian jobs data later this week. So, uh, you know, something that I think will be potentially a market mover, but I'm going to pass it over to you guys. But before I do that, let me mention that we do have our uh, Cyber Monday sale. It is buy one month, get one month free. Do not let this pass you up. If you have been sitting on the sidelines and you're like, oh, you know, I've been wanting to use Forex analytics, but just haven't had the chance or, you know, was just kind of waiting for the right time. This is a great time because now you get 50% off and you can try it out for the remainder of the year uh, and, and going into the beginning of next year, which arguably are going to be probably some of the best months to trade, especially the last 12 months. But December and January, you're probably going to see a lot of volatility. So this is a great, great opportunity for you guys to really, you know, judge Forex Analytics, see how you like the platform, see how you like the chat room, um, you like interacting with our community. So take advantage of the offer. Uh, don't forget, it is, it is for today available until December 4th, which is just two days from now. So, um, so jump on, jump on board when you can. All right, I'm going to pass it over to you guys. Have a good Thank one, you, Blake. Blake. Have a Thank great you. one, and uh, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow morning. Thank you. See you tomorrow, mate. Bye-bye. So how, are you, a, how are you doing, Mr. Spock? Which <laughs> one is Mr. Spock? Is that Steve? Yeah, you know, everything. Is oh, logical. Lo it's, it's logical. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, you're not being logical. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, you're Captain <laughs> he, Kirk. He can, so. he, can also, he can also do the Vulcan grip. I know it. Uh, really? Yeah, I can. Uh, you can? Uh, how about a mind meld? <laughs> It'll be scary uh, if you ever put your head on my hand and you figure out what you start to hear and see what's in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, go, go ahead. All right. I, I have. I hope nothing too kinky. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, see there. I knew you'd go there. All right. No, you'd be bored. Uh, go so, ahead. Um, we have uh, we have Gregor coming in in like five minutes or so. So a couple of things use market be my final right. Sorry. U.S. market manufacturing PMI final. Uh, where is that? Upcoming events. Oh, upcoming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yes. yes. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I don't see anything else in the... Yes, yes, sorry. I, I, didn't, I thought you meant something that happened already. I mean, we had some PMIs today from Europe, and they were all pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of things I want to mention. One, which not too many people are talking about, is that the... Um, the German coalition right now is the CDU, which is Merkel's uh, uh, party, and the, sorry, um, yes, yeah, CDU and also the SPD, and they, they um, uh, elected new leaders, which have been quite um, uh, critical of the government. So, you know, this is creating a little bit of a tension in, in Germany, but uh, Angela Merkel, obviously, we know is outgoing, and... Um, uh, she did say that, you know, there, there's not going not gonna to be any renegotiation of the terms of their alliance, etc. But just something that's just bringing a little bit more um, instability, let's say. Uh, but obviously nothing major. Um, we talked about China before. Um, the um, UK election polls there, remember, we're 10 days away from elections. And uh, the lead of the Conservatives is narrowing a little bit. We have some, there was one poll which had it at six percentage points, but there are others which have it at like 12, 13. So I think around 10 is probably the current gap, but 10 days is a long time. So that thing might move and imagine what's going to happen to the markets if that goes to, you know, low single digits. It's going to be, the pound is definitely going to be volatile going into it. Uh, but it seems at the moment that it's still almost a done deal for the conservatives and, uh, you know, the betting shops are still giving pretty good odds uh, for, for that. So um, what else is happening? Okay, we have oil as well. Uh, Dale talked about it. Uh, the Saudis have been talking about um, adding to the production uh, cuts. Uh, surprise, surprise, we have the Aramco IPO coming. So oh. <laughs> they want the price to go up. They Who would have guessed? They did actually mention it as well. They said, no, we have to, to discuss maybe adding 400,000 barrels more per day to the existing cuts. 
and also we have the Aramco IPO in the same sentence. So it's like, you know, don't make it too obvious. What was the um, catalyst for the three dollar decline Friday? Still, do you know? I don't know. Good I question. mean, was was there? A, I mean, we have Bryn Kelly. She's an energy person, but I was wondering if it was an API report or something. I mean, three bucks when no one's looking. Uh, pretty major move. Like that's, the, that's the best time of the day to do it right. when nobody's yeah. looking, right? Yeah. yeah. And it was they a wear you out like, and then it happens. Yeah, it was like a one hour candle which did all the all the damage. It was beautiful. Yeah. I, I yeah, but and I don't know what was behind it. People Just, that have been people that, makes that it have more been, bearish if it wasn't bearish news. People that have been Forex Analytics subscribers and people that have been listening in the face. They knew that, you know, we warned multiple times that the upside is likely very, very limited and there is a big chance of a breakdown and another leg to the downside. And so far today, what we've seen is a short-term recovery, which has brought crude, let me maximize the chart, which has oh, brought back crude. Back to the breakdown. Yeah, retesting uh, the breakdown of this channel. So... Um, I, I do think that, you know, that daily candle on Friday is, you know, qu quite a big one to ignore. And uh, I doubt it that crude can just, you know, continue from here upwards without, like nothing has happened. I do believe that the path of least resistance remains lower. We did find support in this vicinity, which is a support area. But I think that sooner rather than later, we're going to bridge through this 5450, in which case um, I think that there is no real support until we get back down to 51, roughly. It's, it's one of the larger candles with one of the smallest volume bars. So if it, yeah. didn't, so it didn't take much to make it happen. No, and there's indeed. no news. Uh, to like say what well, was driven by, and that tells me there's some inherent structural weakness. Ga if they could do that in an hour. Roshan suggested no cuts, and perhaps that oh, one have. Might that's have it. Played Big deal. Game. Yeah. Wow. Anyway. Anyhow, Greg is going to be with us soon, so it's a good idea to see from an Elliott wave, wave perspective what he also thinks is going to happen. As I said. He was bearish, uh, I, looking for it to peak. Yeah, uh, we we were as well. I mean, uh, no. for me, this this uh, move on Friday and this retest is an excellent opportunity to uh, to look lower towards fifty one. I mean, I've I've, I've, said, I've said it multiple times, and uh, I, I remain of the same opinion. So, crude definitely one of the big movers and one worth mentioning. But for me, an equivalently important move is this one, which we, we, which we have been expecting for quite some time, right? The breakout from this yeah. inverted head and shoulders formation. From the bottom of the right shoulder, we started talking about it. Yes, yes. So I do think that Kiwi can squeeze higher from here. And just by looking at today's candle so far, uh, I think makes it uh, obvious. Anyhow, I'm here every day. Um, and we can talk about a lot of uh, stuff. Uh, Greg, yeah, I'll, I'll tell light. you, Steve, that move in crude was so shocking uh, and earth-shattering to me. I spilled my bong water all over my desk. <laughs> <laughs> so Greg doesn't have the uh, luxury of being here every day. So yeah. Greg, you, you are unmuted, mate. Um, why don't you start by what we were talking about, the big moves that we've had? Uh, big on moves Fridays. from a, from yeah. a technical hey. perspective, <clears throat> uh, uh, both from yes. Kiwi breaking out from this inverted head and shoulders formation and crude breaking through that ascending channel. What do you think about them? By the way, you can uh, you can go ahead and grab the screen. I stopped sharing. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning, by the way. I hope you're well. I know that Greg has a lot of, uh, he's very busy during the Christmas season because the Wizard of Waves, he goes up to the North Pole and helps Santa get ready for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Right, Greg? Yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It's very busy December, <laughs> like always. Yeah, you take your sled up there. Don't let Steve drive your sled. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a fast drive. <laughs> All okay, right, so here we go. You, you mentioned Kiwi, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, we covered this one actually a few weeks back, if you remembered, and you all already highlighted head and shoulders back then. And I said that, yes, we could agree based on the short-term outlook because I was looking for potential recovery back to this trend line resistance. So I'm just, I would be very careful up there around 65.40 up to 65.50. I'm also looking at the Aussie dollar, which um, with the one that I obviously want to make some parallels when I'm looking at the Kiwi. So, of course, uh, they're correlated. Although, although we've seen a very good move lower by, in the Aussie Kiwi. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, but still, I mean, sooner or later, they will... Uh, yes, they will get up to each other, yes. Yes, exactly. So, I think that Aussie has a much better looking structure, okay? I mean, it, at least it's, it's very clear to me. Uh, what we have seen is a five waves up here from October lows. And this actually fits into this corrective structure that I, I'm tracking since August of this year. And ideally this correction has come to an end because we, uh, we turned lower with five waves, waves one, two, three, four, five. So I would be expecting more weakness after these three waves of recovery. And when this market completes a correction, maybe that's also the same timing when Kiwi could stop at that trend line resistance as well. Let's mm -hmm. not forget that on a daily chart of uh, of Aussie, we are still in this downtrend channel. Okay, we failed to break above it. So in my opinion, this Aussie um, is is looking bearish. And But when it comes to trading, obviously, I would be mo much more interested in Aussie shorts rather than any Kiwi short. So from if maybe Aussie is really now making a corrective recovery, then your head and shoulders outlook and for potential more gains from here makes total sense actually. Because what about what about I agree with you? And by the way, the same channel you're looking in the Aussie is the same channel I have on my chart as well. And you know, I've indicated multiple times that as long as we trade within the channel, I can't possibly turn you know bullish. The Aussie that is also one of the reasons why I, I like uh, Aussie Kiwi getting rejected from an ascending channel to the downside, and it's, it seems to be actually accelerating lower. Uh, what do you think about Aussie Kiwi? Does it have more downside? Yes, I think more more downside, but in the meantime, I would be expecting this corrective recovery. However, I adjusted the wave count on the bigger picture here, and mm -hmm. I still think that we are in this very big contracting range that may not uh, be over anytime soon. So we could easily stay here trapped in this for some time, for another but eventually months. lower lows. Yes, exactly. But in in the meantime, when we are trading lower at those. Um, till the new year, we could see this corrective wave be a recovery. So maybe this move will slow down once we approach the lower side of the current channel. What about crude? Do you, do you mm. like the idea that it has stopped in at least the short to medium term? Um, crude, what I like so far is that, like uh, Dale said earlier, that market make a very strong big candle. Uh, mm -hmm. after a very long time. So it looks like this is a valid breakdown. What I also see is DAX is currently trading sharply to the downside. So I'm I'm expecting risk of moves, at least a corrective pullback. Uh, so with crude oil already being weakening now, I think that if US indexes also will turn to the downside, I just think that this will cause even more more damage on crude oil if we yeah, I'm with you. risk off across the uh, uh, different markets uh, and when looking at the wave count i'm i'm looking here at a wave e okay wave e that completed this um, maybe a larger degree triangle that i have been tracking almost whole year here oh so and you're looking for much lower prices then. yes exactly so at least back towards this lower trend line uh, is what i would expect so 53 52 uh, the, this is what I would be looking for over the next few weeks. Um, but what's the key here for today's price action? It's actually, I don't, 
trust often moves only by one day, okay? It was a sell-off on Friday, so if we are turning bearish, we definitely have to see progression of this trend in the next two days, okay? So with you. if that's a real breakdown, then, then this was a way for, and in the next 24 hours, I want to see this market to trading lower into wave five. If that would happen, then we would have a follow through, which means that, yes, this trend in change, uh, this uh, changing trend is really here and could take us much, much lower. Uh, so in such case, I would probably watch out for a wave four pullback and then uh, look for even lower shorts. Yes, but for um, now, it's still... We have another important potential formation here. Um, I don't know if you've drawn it like that on your charts, but there is, I, I wrote about it last week as well in the chart of the day. There is a potential nice inverted head and shoulders formation in the USD yen. We're currently testing the neckline. Um, it was one of the charts I would be showing today. Uh, what do you think about it? What do you think about the USD yen from here? Um, I just think that dollar yen touched some very important trend line. Uh, let me just look at it. Uh, here's the weekly chart. Uh, let me just check this. If I would connect this trend line, yes, we are just at this trend line. If you connect the swing highs mm -hmm. from um, 2000, from actually from a year back, Okay, it was November and October from 2018, and then you have this uh, April 2019 swing highs. So we are right there. And what I'm thinking is that sooner or later, wave D will, uh, will complete the current rise. So looking at the daily charts, um, there's a chance that this is an ABC, X, ABC move for a wave D, and that we sooner or later will see a reversal lower. So I think that there is a chance for a limited upside here, and if dollar index is really going to see more weakness, which I think it's very valid from this current resistance levels, I will cover it in a second, then obviously dollar yen could also come under pressure. And as I said, I'm expecting risk off. Um, also, I think it's very important to remind us ourselves about this 10 year US notes. Um, still, we are in uptrend here. Okay, we came down from the highs in three waves. We bounce from these lower support levels and looks like that right now, it's a very key level for the 10 year US notes based on the short term uh, picture. What I see here is a five wave recovery. Everyone who is familiar with the Elliott wave theory will know that this is a very important reversal point, especially when you have a free wave drop from the previous highs. So now on the intraday charts with today's sell off um, and when actually S&P 500 and even DAX at the start of the session moved all to the, to the upside, I think that now it's a very key timing for potential trending change. DAX is already coming down and... Yeah, DAX and, minus 0, 0.75% already. Yes, and I see much more weakness possible for DAX and this could obviously maybe also impact um, US indexes. But the key is here. If we see a bounce in the next 24 hours, then I really think that there will be much more potential available here for the 10 year US notes. And I would not be surprised if dollar yen would actually come much, much lower. And since we are talking about yen, let me take a look on ASEAN as well. Now in this risk of sentiment. Um, yeah, uh, it's one of the charts I've been, correct. I've been monitoring very, very closely because <laughs> of that exact trend line that you're looking at there. It's been towing around. Actually, uh, you know, Gregor, I, I, the way I have drawn OZ yen, which is also a valid interpretation, is like um, an ascending wedge. So, for example, if instead of looking at, at it as a channel, you, con you connect 1A with C, it's like a wedge, right? So I have that. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that's how I w I'm, I'm looking at it. So actually, um, what I wanted to uh, point out here is that Pound yen, for example, is very strong, right? And if we are going to see risk off, because pound yen is at the highest risk off, then I will not look, uh, be looking to short pound yen. I will look at the ASEAN because it's much weaker. ASEAN is already showing very structure now without stocks turning down yet. But if we're really going to see a reversal, then I think that ASEAN can see a very big hit here to the downside. 
from an Elliott wave perspective, what is very important here that we have a triangle in the middle of this recovery. Okay, and we know that this cannot be then wave two. So it's a wave B, it means it's a corrective recovery. And I would be looking for minimum reversal back down towards 73.30 or 73, but obviously this may lead to much, much uh, further declines here on ASEAN. Um, also, I'm probably, will probably be looking for gold to find some support, but the short term structure is not very clear. I'm not sure if wave four has finished here at uh, 14.45 or are we going to see another dip here and then... Yeah, I, I have the same question in my mind as well. Uh, I've been saying it here on the webinar. I mean, I said that it's likely to see another move towards 14.30, uh, but I'm definitely medium to long term bullish. I mean, I don't know if we've bottomed or we we have to go a little bit lower, but I think we're going a lot higher afterwards. Oh, yes. And actually, if the price action with the 10 year US notes is going perfectly. And why I'm considering potential bottom here is because, as I said, 10 year US notes are at very key potential support levels right now. And if the 10 year will shut up, then obviously gold may immediately attract more buyers as well. So we may not see even 1445. But from a clear Elliott wave perspective, and based on this activity that, is, that I see, I would not be surprised if this happened. Okay, and then maybe I will wait a new bounce in five waves on a smaller degree time frame, because at this stage, still, I just cannot say and be completely sure that wave four has bottomed. But what is important is that the whole decline from these highs is very choppy overlapping. And to me, it looks like a correction on the way, uh, on the way up. It was just a healthy pose that takes longer to unfold with an uptrend that is... You mentioned before uh, yeah. the dollar index. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious to see what you're looking for there. We had a nice potential double top for roughly at 98.50 um, yes. and, and a very nice outside shooting star on Friday. So we closed the week on, definitely yes. on a negative note. Uh, do you think the correction is over? That's it? I think that it actually it's perfect timing and it's it's also perfect personality of this market. You know, we have been trading higher, but we always made some pullbacks. And what was the key was that a break on Friday or last week well, did not see any progress to the upside. It just cleared uh, some stops above 98.50. Mm -hmm. Then we... Yeah, you know, that was Friday, Greg, when no one was around. But, yes, yeah. then we, exactly, and then we actually closed bearish on Friday. So, in my opinion, this could lead to more weakness here. You the, know what, uh, what is a telltale signal for me, and I was mentioning it here on the webinar. I don't know if you frequently cover it. Um, we have like a big ascending wedge, which we've broken down from in USD SEC. And I've noticed that use this sec often leads these kind of moves in the euro, etc. So I don't know if you cover use this sec. Um, occasionally, I look uh, at it, but not. Have a look. Have a look at it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. You know a secret to trading. <laughs> for you'll sell it. For... Oh, you gave it away. Oh, okay. Go to a daily. Mm. Okay, now, uh, you can already see the trend line resistance. Yep, that's it. Okay, yep, now you see it, yes. So actually this one, we're trying to say that this one is, can be showing us already a direction that dollar index will face. Yes. Because it's it's uh, very weak actually, yes. And from an Elliott wave perspective, I would say even this is wave A, wave B, you would probably looking be looking for a drop, let me just, or a drop towards 9.3, I guess. Yeah. Because that's the quality. So obviously I'm, I'm with you here. Also, um, what I like about the Euro dollar is that this really appears to be very important level. We not only why, uh, one, we have spiked twice down to this level. 
around the 61.8 percent and now we it are is the 61 yes yes yeah. it is so i think it's it's a very nice structure that could take us higher here um we are already progressing to the upside and if this current price will unfold in five waves then we know that uh, also, also to mention that uh, at least from what i see around me and i guess you have the same uh, idea uh the crowd remains very bearish the euro usd which is another thing i like yes that's definitely one of the best contrarian real contrarian signals right yeah yes i absolutely agree here so uh, when looking at the euro what would my minimum upward uh, projection is here around uh 1.1250 uh, because even if that would be only a recovery of in three waves as part of a downtrend that is still in progress, it's still I would be looking for this level to be retested. So ideally, this whole corrective decline would be fully retraced that we have been tracking for for what for five six weeks now. Uh, Greg, uh, I, I I only disagree in one sense for, uh, with that. Um, I have a descending trend line that confluences with the 200 daily moving average, which confluences with the little double top we had up there, all of them passing from 111.80. So personally, I believe that once the pair squeezes through 111.80, I think it's going to extend much higher than people believe. So I, I think that 112.50 is, is probably a conservative target. If we, yes, if, exactly if we manage to slash through 111.80. Yes. But of course, from an Elliott Wave perspective, I would be looking maybe for a Christmas back into this area of a fourth wave. How about US dollar yen, Gregor? Is it we, completing? We covered, we, we covered that. Uh, oh, gosh, sorry. We I just walked away. Okay, <clears throat> forget it. Um, I can take a look at DAX since it's moving, uh, just to give you the perspective what might be happening on DAX here. Uh, we shouldn't get too bearish, which probably will happen when uh, market or crowd will realize that market is trading aggressively to the downside. But when looking at the structure, this could only be upcoming wave C. And what I see here is that there was some gap here. Okay, and this gap could be once again retested around 13,000. And um, obviously that's perfect wave C target when looking at this potential wave four retracement. Uh, the 38.2% is much lower, but if we are going to see this gap playing out an important role, then obviously 23.6 is the level where we could also see the first evidence of a support. So we may not get too bearish here, but at least short term, it looks like that wave C can be in the cards. Here I have this hourly chart where clearly a recovery from uh, November 21st was much slower and more choppy compared to the previous sharp decline. So for me, this looks more like an impulse. This looks more like a correction. That's why I'm expecting wave C to drop below these uh, wave A levels. So uh, in the meantime, I think that the S&P 500 at least could uh, make a short term pullback from current highs. We have a friend here, uh, I know we covered it, but he says, Greg, I see treasuries continuing to collapse and no reversal to the upside. Is such a formation possible from your analysis? In my opinion, Greg, instead of covering the treasuries again, why don't you open the 10-year yield chart, which is invertly correlated? Because I think this also shows nicely that this is potentially a very nice rebound in the yields that just a second what's the ticker uh in uh yeah in trading, trading u yes. U us 10 y us 10 y well, yeah us 10 y no it's not correct you are you are the y there why yeah there you go Uh, actually, we have been looking with Dale. We have been looking for potential resistance around 2%. Yeah. Yes. That's a weekly chart, by the way. Probably we should go on the daily or something. 
yes, that's a weekly chart. So, I mean, it's okay. Um, for me, it, it looks like a very nice unfolding downtrend. Okay. And I agree. From an Elliott wave perspective, I will just level this really quickly. This would be wave one, wave two, you will have an extended wave three, you have and a wave four. four and wave five. Yes. Also, we moved with this wave four back into this area of a previous fourth wave. So it was a perfect timing, perfect resistance, and looks uh, like it's just a matter of time when we will see another turn down here. I agree. That's why I said look at the yields as well. Uh, yeah. We have another friend asking here for um, uh, Bitcoin. Okay, just give me a second. Bitcoin has been trapping people all around. I mean, especially that 40% move higher within the one day that was completely retraced. I mean, no, the, the problem with Bitcoin is that everyone now expects that they will see something similar like, it, like they have seen here in uh, 2017 then at the start of this year and now again and it just market just does doesn't work that way uh you know it's there are di different peri periods and differ a different um activity of each market and i just think would not be surprised actually if we are just going to see consolidation here that will not be broken anytime soon um, but at least on the short-term basis we could see a recovery uh, I would say in three waves minimum away from these current support levels here from away from 78.6% and 61.8 level. Um, we came down with an overlapping uh, price move against the previous five wave price. So from an to wave perspective, the ideal would be that we would see five waves to the upside. But the problem is that there is there are still too many optimism for this to happen. and if everyone expects that market will really rise, I'm concerned that maybe it's not the right timing. You know, we have to see more pessimism here about around Bitcoin in growth in general before this thing may actually see a real bounce. So it's actually the totally opposite game. I totally, I totally agree. Thank you, um, Braga. Oh, do, do, do we have a, we don't yes. have any more time. We have a guest. Yes, we have a great guest. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you very much, Greca, then. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, you Greca. Bye-bye, mate. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank Who you, Steve. Who do we Steve. have today, Coach? Uh, Bryn Kelly. Oh, okay. Nice. Okay, so, Bryn, uh, thank you. Uh, it was my bad. I I didn't put the K in your handle on Twitter. So, okay. Thanks, Steve. I didn't promote her yet. And now that I guess I have to take the screen, huh? Nobody has the screen at the moment. That's not a problem. Just find here. Oh, I hear participants. All right, I got it. No, oh, there she is, Bryn. Okay, Bryn. We promoted to panelists, and now I'm going to unmute you. Oh. Happy holidays, Brent. Same to you. Can't believe I'm, it's December. Uh, unbelievable. I mean, you know, uh, time like the sands in the hourglass <laughs> are the days of our lives. That's right. You watched it. Just didn't you? On time. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I know. It was a soap opera, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I forgot how much younger you are than me. No, I uh, know. Uh, no, all I right. just wasn't a soap opera fan. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? If you're a trader, you don't have to watch it. You can live it. So um, yeah. Uh, pretty unusual to see. Everyone, this is Bryn Kelly. She's one of the best energy analysts I know, and I've interviewed quite a few. And uh, we had that day, Bryn, with, uh, you know, everyone had their head turned on Friday and crude collapsed three bucks. Uh, what do you think was behind it? It didn't seem like there was much volume for it to be able to be that dramatic. Yeah, you know, uh, I, you know, the, obviously the market is always in search of what was the headline? What was the one thing that did, you know, that led to this? But, you know, to be fair, Friday was Brent expiration. It was gasoline expiration. It was heating oil expiration. It was a holiday week. 
Um, you know, we had an early close. It's yeah. just an easy thing to happen, um, you know, on days when there isn't that much volume. Right. So, you know, that every, you know, of course, that lesson... was asking for the headline or what is it? And yeah, I've been asking. Yeah, it, you know, it, look, we're in a range. We've been, right. you know, in the same range for quite a while here. So we were on the high end of it. It was light volume as people were closing out, you know, Jan Brent and December Arbob and heating oil. You know, you just kind of see. So technical you know, factors of liquidating uh, instead yeah. of taking delivery on some contracts. And are you in the camp that, there's usually pressure on energy products during December because the producers want to blow it out so they're not taxed on it. Well, um, so you're talking about year-end um, yeah. inventory. So LIFO and FIFO, you know, it depends on, on what method some of these big organizations use. Um, usually, you know, the valuation is sometime mid-month. So... It, it's really, it depends on where prices are, right? Okay. Yeah. Depending on, on what, what they'll do. Because, you know, if you're on a LIFO basis, the last transactions you have are what value your inventory. So, you know, you, you kind of yeah. have to know where you are, you know, relative to where it's been the rest of the year. I, I don't know if it'll be that big of a deal this year. I, you know, I, prices have been in such a narrow range this year yeah. that, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know how impactful that will be. You never know. Um, it, it, you know, last year we just had everything falling apart. Right. Right. And, and so why not throw out the baby with the bathwater? Well, um, you know, that, that's a good point. I mean, both, you know, equities had their worst December last year since 29. Uh -huh. And that's when crude was, you know, selling off from 75 to 40. So since then, we've had multiple new highs in the S&Ps. And actually, the WTI stopped at 61.8 back from the recent high. So is uh, the oil market telling us something that it really hasn't had the same degree of recovery that equities did? Well, you know, um, sure, in, in, there's a lot of sentiment involved here and in the oil market. Um, certainly, you could say that carbon is not in favor at the moment. And you, you can imagine that that probably leads to, you know, lower fund flows in, you know, in that direction. Um, you know, so just simple high level things like that kind of drive, you know, what, how people want to position going forward. We've also been through such a period here of U.S. production growth that, you know, nobody's that worried about the upside. It, it feels as if yeah, we have point. this sort of cheap call on, on production. So even if we're laying down rigs, if prices were to move significantly higher, you, you know, it, it takes less time to get, uh, you know, drilling rig on land up and running than it takes, you know, deep water drilling production to get online. And so, so we just have, you know, the market believes in lower lead time, you know, faster response to prices. And, and there's also a, a quandary because, you know, you get, there's a little bit more competition now than, than there has been before in, um, you know, alternatives. And, and I'm certainly not a, like an electric vehicle proponent or anything like that. But, you know, now more than ever, there are, you know, demand response efforts and right. alternatives. And so, you know, the, if you get oil prices too high, you sort of usher in, you open the door a little bigger for some of those, right? If they stay low, you can stay competitive. 
Do you have a view on uh, the Aram Saudi Aramco IPO, whether uh, it's ever going to come off? And uh, is that a factor playing into prices here, in your view? Well, I think I'm in the minority here. I don't really think it has any impact overall on prices. What I would say is, you know, when you see a company that's IPOing, you know, at it's a late stage, we'll call it a late stage IPO, right? Yeah, I mean, it's been around <laughs> and, for a while, and, right? Yeah, late stage. Um, right. And we've seen how those have gone. And, and at okay. some level, you know, and everything that they've published about it, what I note is that they're looking to raise money to diversify out of oil. They're right? looking for uh, bag holders. Well, well, they, they're just trying to raise capital so yeah, that they okay. can upgrade their infrastructure. They can move away from being dependent on oil revenue. Right. And usually, if you see a company you know, come to market, you, you want to see that the proceeds they're raising are going to further the business that they're in. Right? Interesting. And in this way, they're indicating that, you know, that... They, they want to use it. the proceeds to get out of the business. Yeah, very interesting. I, I'd love to see that uh, brochure. That yeah, doing. and I mean, it's, it's what, 5% or something, 10%? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know. I mean, do you think when uh, – does any IPO really affect the underlying price of something? I mean, I don't know. Maybe no. let's look back at like Uber and Lyft, right? When one or the other went public, did we say, oh, my gosh, it's going to be free – or they're going to manipulate the prices of their fares. Sure, they might offer promotions. I mean, I don't know. It's probably a bad example, but like, I don't know if an IPO itself does anything. It's, it's, it's yeah, just, it's just a way to uh, for someone to monetize. cash in and get liquid. <laughs> exactly. Liquefy. Right. And, I mean, uh, and other people supply. come in and take the risk that maybe it's going to work or not after the big guys cash out. Yeah, I mean, they That's certainly the have a proven stream. revenue stream, right? And I mean, yeah. as an investor, you might like that in your portfolio, but it doesn't, it's not like it brings new oil to markets. And, and right. as we've seen, I mean, to date, it's not exactly like they've, you know, anybody has been able to significantly, let's say, control prices, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, we've seen that. Uh, we've seen that attempt. Do you think that we're range bound infinitely, or what do you think would be the catalyst for us either to break down under the range, which is you know about fifty bucks, and break out above the recent range of say fifty eight to sixty? Do you see any catalysts? Uh, I see you have some slides prepared, so I'm going to let you tell us. Yeah. Um... You know, I always have some slides, right? So they're not okay. all the technical stuff that you guys, you know, do so well. But, um, you know, I, I like to... Fondies. I, I like to look for, you know, exactly as you mentioned. What, what, where should, what is breaking out? What could move us? What, what is holding us back? What is the driver? Right. And, you know, the driver really is you know, global demand. And for the US, it's export economics. Because the marginal barrel produced is needs to go, you know, needs to be shipped out of here. Um, so in, in that way, what really is the driver now are let's say Brent prices as a proxy, right? But really, you know, Chinese and, and Middle Eastern prices and the spread between WTI and, and those markets versus the cost to get it there. And okay. one thing that's happened in this fourth quarter is, you know, we had those sanctions on those Costco ships and, you know, a lot of problems insuring ships going through the Straits of Hormuz. And it just got really expensive to get, you know, a barrel of oil from the U.S. over to China. Um, okay. and, and that is where, you know, demand growth is, right? In India, China. And, and we're not that strategically located to those markets. Um, and, and depending on the cost of shipping, you know, we really need to be 
discounted enough to make, you know, to make, make it feasible. Oil. Yeah. Yeah. To make it feasible. I mean, why would China buy oil from us when uh, it doesn't have to abide by the sanctions and can buy from Iran, which is in the neighborhood? Well, it's closer, right? So, yeah. so the shipping costs are less. And, and, and the thing is, you know, if, if we end up being the same price landed, um, you know, you, not, just even from a consumer preference, right? You might say, wow, I just like the thing that's not going to take as long to get here. Um, so in that way, you know, this chart I have up here, you know, the red line is kind of where tanker rates and, I, and I'm using one to the to the UK just okay. because it's a little bit more transparent to also then look at Brent futures. And then I look at the spread between Brent and WTI at Houston because, you know, it costs a couple dollars to get from Cushing to Houston. And you really want to say, like, what is the real economics? And earlier this month, this yellow line we, you know, there was barely enough spread between those two markets to cover yeah. shipping costs. And, and this is not even assuming there aren't any other costs associated with it, right? I mean, yes. I'm clearly just looking at tanker rates. So, so, you know, you can say that even if it looks like there's a 25 cents, it's probably not, probably less than that. And, and you know, at some level, sort of the end of next year look like, you know, not not even a go but last week with you know the move in brent that those premium that spread kind of widened out a little bit yes. relative to the us and that's i think where you need to look for the driver to you know move us out of a range if brent can't get out of its range wti can't either right because we're now trying to get to those markets okay and if you kind of look at the complex overall, you know, the red line is Brent mm -hmm. and this kind of fluorescent blue line is Oman, right? Which is Middle Eastern crude. Mm -hmm. And for most of this year, the front, you know, Oman and Middle Eastern grades have been pricing over even Brent. And, you know, that's because of the OPEC cuts, right? Mm -hmm. So they were tightening it up kind of in their area, in their region. And, and Oman's a little bit heavier crude than, than Brent or WTI. And, and so it's, you, you can see the backwardation in that curve, right? And yeah. everybody, you know, prior to this upcoming OPEC meeting, the curve is look really backwardated until you get to March when the cuts, you know, are set to expire. And then it kind of trails off a little bit. And I think that's probably where some of the opportunity is, you know, the coming front, this March. Yeah. Well, you know, first quarter versus fourth quarter, right. Has okay. been pretty significantly backwardated, um, okay. at least in Brent. And, and for <laughs> listeners that don't know, that's the sign of a bull market, right? Where demand is in the front market and uh, higher prices and your deferred contracts or less. Well, that's kind of a misnomer, right? Because in this case, if we use this, right, it means that, um, like, if if there are manufacture, if there's manufactured tightness through cuts, and you expect those cuts to expire, yeah, you know, the it's not bullish that the front is over the back, right? It's just logic. Okay. Um, so, you know, and that's sort of been the struggle for this market to kind of come to terms with, right? These spreads have been so strong um, in the front and, and people want to think, well, wow, hey, geez, that really means, um, you know, this is a bull market. It, we saw this also in 2014, right? When prices were like 150 bucks or something. Yeah. And the deferreds that, were cheaper. And way cheaper. We had yeah. some real significant backwardation, as a matter of fact, you know. Uh, so that's a really interesting because, you know, most of us are trained to believe that a 
carrying charge market is, uh, you know, could be a bear market and a backward dated market is a bull market. And so you're poking a hole in that uh, teaching that it's not always true. Well, you know, I'm, and even the example of the carrying charge market that a lot of times happens when, um, you know, the market wants, they believe we need to build inventory. So okay. they'll pay for it, right? And, and, yeah. and in that way, we've had bull runs in, you know, carrying markets, right? Because it's, it's like we're, we, we believe it could be tighter in the future. Yeah. Um, and and anyway, Interesting. This, this chart I have up is um, one year calendar spread. So it's Jan versus Jan. And I just use that one because Jan's the prompt contract right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this big backwardation here, which was the 2014, 2015, so Jan 14, Jan 15, where, you know, we were almost seven, eight dollars backwardated at expiration. You know, if you remember, that was just prior to really all of the shale production hitting. Right. And so it made sense that, you know, the front of the that market. That was 140 crude. Back then? Correct. Okay. And, and then all of a sudden we collapsed, right? right. And, and yeah. sure enough here, right? We see as soon as that happened, then, you know, the front dipped back. You know, there have yeah. only been you know, a handful of times over the last 10 or so years that the market's really sort of at expiration, right? On a 12-month basis, been in backwardation. Right. And, and it typically falls back below because the front doesn't really like to get that far away from the back, unless there is like a Saudi production, you know, disruption. And, you know, unless there's an actual event. Geo, yeah. Yeah, geopolitical or, you know, pipeline breakdown or, you know, a hurricane, something like that. Other than that, it doesn't really, it, it's hard to get too far, you know, disconnected from the back without the back responding. Okay. Um, and, and so, you know, we have right now the 2021 sitting here and, you know, we've been in kind of backwardation for a while, dipped a little bit um, beginning of the year. But, you know, I don't know if, if they extend, you know, here's the thing to watch for this OPEC meeting. So currently the cuts are supposed to expire at the end of March, you know, kind of thought that they may extend them maybe through the end of the year. Um, that, that'd probably be the, the best to hope for, right? Is, is you know, they, that's ten, they've tended to go like nine months at a time. Okay. So you wonder if the front to back spreads will be as strong, right? Because you'd think the back should get a little bit more you know, valued relative to the front if the same conditions are going to occur, right? If, if, if the cuts are now through the whole year, then you might expect some of these spreads to flatten out a little bit. If they don't, you know, it's a sign that, man, I mean, there must be some big economic slowdown, right? Yeah, Global. okay. So <laughs> that, that'll that be your... Happen. That'll be your market tell if they make the cuts and you don't get uh, this type of uh, move that normally would happen. Yeah, and I don't know that people are, you know, they've been so accustomed to buy the spread as a proxy for buying flat price. You know, it's easier to buy, you know, Jan March at 35 cents than, you know, to buy the outright. Yeah, um, less risk. Yeah, and, and in that way, I don't, you know, I... I I'll just be interested to see if, it, you know, at least that's what I'll, I'll be watching for is for some of these spreads to come off. I mean, again, it depends on, on what they're, you know, they're planning to say. I think I took something off of their website yesterday. Um, you know, they talk about their meeting on the 5th and, you know, they said they really have two critical decisions. One is the fate of the current agreement, which expires on the 31st of March, right? And that's what we've talked mm. about. Yeah. Um, so they have to decide whether or not to renew it. And then the second is, given the outlook for the oil market in the first and second quarters, where demand is forecast to dampen, while production, you know, is forecast to rise, um, you know, they need to see if they want to make deeper cuts. Yeah. 
you know, I, I okay. think that would be a, you know, red. I, yeah, I it's a, kind of a, a weak statement uh, that the market might be in trouble. You know, there's something I've been reading about, you know, a lot of people believe that there's going to be problems. The next bubble is in corporate debt. But I've been reading that there are some challenges uh, for the frackers that they're having some challenges with their debt in being able to roll it over and it's being downgraded seriously. Is that an issue for U.S. production? I mean, could we have an, a credit crisis in the uh, fracking industry? Do you see anything like that coming, Bryn? Um, I mean, uh, certainly I've heard those same stories and, you know, uh, sure, you know, I, I, it, I, I think there are some, some smaller players, right, that, that just might not be able to sustain here. How about the, the especially problem, if prices are under, say, average under $50 uh, a barrel for, say, six months? I think it's actually more in some of the natural gas producers. Natural gas, okay. Um, because especially those that are concentrated, um, you know, in the Appalachian region. But but do you how trade? Really do you trade the Widowmaker? Well, I know the Widowmaker is the March April in natural gas. It's our Bob <laughs> okay. heating oil in, in crude oil. But um, you know, we don't even need to go into that because that that, that um. Uh, that also is used as a proxy for flat price and it always fails. But the thing about this, I, I do want to touch on this credit thing because in reality, what the, how things play out is that you end up with some bankruptcies and when those happen, firms can come in and buy you know, these companies for pennies on the dollar. Yeah or they restructure and come out of bankruptcy, regardless, they end up with a cheaper cost to produce, right? Because if you wipe away your debt, yeah. you suddenly now have a cheaper barrel. And, and that we've, you know, we've seen, it's, it's been the result over and over again of bankruptcies. It doesn't really, you know, a result in a, a loss of, production per se, because somebody will take them on either they'll operate, you know, under bankruptcy, you know, restructuring right. or, or they'll be purchased. And, and all you're doing is wiping out the debt that was driving, you know, their marginal break even price in the first place. That is really a pearl. So uh, bankruptcy does not make the oil disappear. It I just mean, makes it easier to sell. Yeah, it might make it not you know you might i mean the oil is all still there right it's whether right. or not it's actively being produced so you might bankruptcy see. poof and it doesn't disappear no so Bryn, Bryn i mean really uh i i have a hard time uh being able to keep up with all the different things that you look at in energies and that's why i consider you a great resource for people that just aren't directional traders, the way you look at spreads and you look at carrying and you look at uh, things like uh, the costs of transporting oil and how to take advantage of it. So uh, for people that are oil bugs or energy uh, advocates and what that's what they trade, uh, why don't you show people where they could find you and get a hold of your research and, and use you as a intelligence gathering source for the inner workings of the energy industry. Yeah. So there's um, a few ways and well, thanks for being so complimentary. Dale. Yeah, you well, know, you are, it's like you guys you look know. for signals on a chart. Yeah. I, I'm just looking for a signal in a different place. Right. 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 Um, and, and, and that's it. So I, the easiest, you know, place to find me is on Twitter at Bryn K. Kelly. Yeah, don't forget um, the K like I did. Yeah, I know. I okay, know. so the I other should. Bryn Kelly, I don't know what she does. I think. <laughs> I, uh, anyway. I, I think there is another one. <laughs> there is Bryn. one. Yeah, because <laughs> the the handle worked, but it wasn't you. Anyway, so, <laughs> so this is this is the real Bryn Kelly. Go ahead. The real go Bryn ahead. Kelly. Yeah. yeah, and I um, also uh, 
um, partnered with Cornerstone Futures and, and working with them in the oil markets, publishing um, weekly research and, and providing insight to clients. Um, and so you can find me, you know, I post that research online again through Twitter, um, you know, or and Cornerstone contact information. And also I do a lot of training for individual, you know, traders that just want to understand how to find and look and pull all of this together. And, and on that, you can reach out to me on my Fundamental Angle website. The oh, you want to show Twitter. that? Um, you, it's on Twitter, thefundamentalangle.com. Oh, okay. 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 I don't know if I have it up. Or okay. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm afraid it'll bring me up to, yeah, see, it's going to bring me into my admin page. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, it's fundamentalangle.com. It's on the Twitter handle. You can click on it and click contact me. Um, and don't, like I said, don't feel that just because you're an individual that maybe you don't, that it's not tailored for you. I, I mean, I, I, I've worked with all levels on being able to analyze a particular trade or really it comes down to education. So um, cool. you can find me easily. It's just the easiest way to find me. So, uh, so Bryn is mentoring people that want to learn what she knows and Bryn, you know, I always appreciate you coming here and uh, giving us some of your time. And I hope that this winter uh, holiday trading season that uh, and everything else in your life is a gusher and that <laughs> and the pips rain down on you like Amen. an oil field that you know uh has really hit a, a real important artery so amen let's hope for yeah. a, a, an exciting next four weeks yeah so thanks a lot i want to wish you uh you know happy holidays Bryn, and and have a great new year and uh, really appreciate uh, all you do to try and help people understand complexities that um, you really would have to spend uh, multiple years just getting a handle on it if you did it yourself. I always say, Bryn, tell me if you agree with me, with me. You can't learn experience. It only happens with the passing of time and living through stuff, but you can learn from the experienced absolutely absolutely okay. you know there's no book on how to get the experience but you know there are there are, there are bonus points in life for seeking out those who have it so but okay. you said it yeah, better that's beautiful all right so Bryn thanks very much uh, I'll get your Twitter handle right next time and thanks for being with us and edifying the community today absolutely happy holidays all right, Bryn. Everyone, that's Bryn Kelly, and you could follow her on Twitter at Bryn K. Kelly. That's a wrap for us today, everyone. See everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. Good hunting. Don't forget, we still have the cyber sale going on, two for one, until I believe Tuesday. Adios, everyone. You're welcome, Ingmar. See ya. Oh, yeah. Don't forget to, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. And what the heck, be one. Adios.